We good? All right, the recording has started. Like, yeah. Welcome to the uh, inaugural mm -hmm. uh, Ceph Tech Talk here. The first one here is uh, going to be Sam Just talking about uh, Rados and all of its bits and pieces. So, uh, Sam, you want to go ahead and uh, get started? Sure. Thanks. OK. Uh, so the topic of this talk is Rados, how it's used, and uh, a bunch of information about the internals, well, the architecture anyway. So let's start with an overview of how the pieces fit together, or of how Ceph is sort of designed. Uh, Ceph's design stems from a few fundamental principles. To handle today's massive storage requirements, each component must be able to scale horizontally. There must be no single point of failure. Ceph must self-manage, and Ceph must self-manage in order to maximize flexibility. And we are open source to run on commodity hardware. That cuts down costs and increases flexibility. So, uh, we provide a unified storage solution, including object storage via Rados GW or Rados directly, virtual block storage via RBD, and a shared POSIX file system via CephFS. What all these services have in common, however, is that they are built on a single service managing placement replication called Rados. So let's talk a little bit about how uh, these components are able to use Rados, and that'll give us uh, a basis for talking about how Rados works. So let's start with the Rados Gateway. The Rados Gateway provides an S3 interface to applications which want to consume an object interface, but don't necessarily want to deal with the complexity of uh, LibRados, uh, using LibRados directly. Uh, a Rados Gateway deployment includes a Rados cluster with a set of Rados Gateway processes which serve S3 requests from applications using a LibRados connection to the Rados cluster. So Rados GW acts as a translator uh, it's the, each Rados GW process is a stateless uh, gateway, which translates S3 requests into LibRados requests to the storage server. So Rados GW itself doesn't store anything, but it uses LibRados to handle the storage and uh, replication. Similarly, RBD provides a block interface backed by a Rados cluster. The hypervisor uses libRBD to translate block reads and writes into LibRados operations on objects in the Rados cluster. Each RBD image ends up chunked or striped across four megabyte objects strewn across the Rados cluster according to the Rados placement policies. Uh, this way, uh, as you spray random IO, for example, across an RBD image, you actually hit tons of OSDs and not a single disk. Finally, for applications looking for a file system interface, there is CephFS. A CephFS deployment requires a set of metadata servers in addition to the Rados cluster. These servers do not store metadata locally, but as with RBD and Rados UW, uh, use the LibRados interface to store the data inside of the Rados cluster. Clients send metadata requests to the metadata servers, but perform file data operations directly on the backing objects in the Rados cluster. That is the CephFS clients act as clients to the metadata servers, but they are also themselves direct Rados clients. They are able to send reads and writes directly to the OSD holding the data, rather than having to go through an intermediate layer. So the takeaway is that all of these services are much, much simpler because all of the data storage and replication and placement is handled by, by uh, Rados. Rados provides a handy abstraction for persisting and managing data. Uh, I'll be focusing on Rados for the remainder of the talk. Uh, separating the storage and replication out in this way also allowed us to slide erasure coding and cache tiering in at the Rados level, allowing, for the most part, the other services to use them tran transparently. So the Rados interface tries to make it simple to reason about accessing distributed storage. Objects are divided into a flat names in, into flat namespace pools. Each pool can have different placement rules allowing the user, for example, to place some objects exclusively on fast SSD OSDs or slow spinning disk OSDs within the same cluster. Applications written against Rados can rely on the relative simplicity of uh, CP style consistency. Users can write applications for Rados using the libRados interface available for C, C++, Python, and several other uh, languages. The interface is quite rich. 
First, we support partial overwrites of objects rather than requiring objects to be overwritten in their entirety. Partial overwrites make something like RBD pretty, pretty simple. The block device is simply broken up, uh, striped or chunked across four megabyte pieces, each of which is a Rados object. Writes and reads are then simply translated into writes and reads on the underlying Rados objects. Each object can also have a set of user-defined X adders, which can be useful for storing small, parts of, small amounts of frequently accessed metadata. We also associate with each object an ordered key value mapping, call, which we call an object map. This object map is currently implemented by keeping a level DB instance within each OSD. Each object's object map is simply a, a prefixed portion of that level DB instance. Uh, this key value mapping is useful, for example, for representing a Rados GW S3 bucket index, which we need to be able to efficiently insert and remove entries from, and also list in order. We also support atomic read and write transactions on a single object. You might use an atomic read transaction to atomically fetch an attribute and an extent of the data payload. Or you might use an atomic write transaction to atomically check an attribute and conditionally add a set of key value mappings. You can also load a Rados object class into the OSD to add additional Rados operations. One example of this we already have is an advisory locking class. Fundamentally, Rados is a cluster of individual processes running on servers in your data center. Most of these processes provide access to the data stored on disks. A few provide cluster management services, which allow the other cluster components to intelligently handle changes in the cluster, like node addition and failure. So the first component is the OSD. We typically have tens to thousands in a cluster. We recommend you have one OSD per disk, or per SSD or RAID group. Uh, these OSDs serve data directly to clients. Clients and uh, OSD members or, and cluster members all have access to the same placement information and, can, and clients can work out which OSD is storing an object independently. Each OSD is also responsible for handling replication and recovery of objects uh, stored on it without need for another coordinator. We'll talk about that a bit later. Uh, Open Office just crashed. One moment. Sorry about that. Okay, a Ceph OSD process manages an individual storage device. In a four disk storage node, we would generally recommend that you run four OSDs, one per disk, rather than aggregating the disks into a single RAID. This way you can exploit uh, Ceph failure recovery, which particularly with erasure coding can be much more efficient than resilvering a disk in a RAID array. The other component of a RAIDOS cluster uh, is the monitor cluster. The monitor cluster is responsible for maintaining a consistent cluster map via Paxos. When OSDs are added, removed, or die, or change location, the, monitors create, the monitor cluster creates a new cluster map reflecting the change. These maps are then propagated via gossip to the OSDs and used by the OSDs to independently rebalance or heal stored data, depending on the nature of the change. Monitors are not involved in the data path at all except to create these maps. Once equipped with a cluster map, Rados clients are able to talk directly to the OSD serving the object. So let's talk a bit about pl uh, object placement in Ceph. This is kind of where the magic lives. So when a Rados client tries to access an object, I've said that it is able to talk directly to the storage node without involving a gateway. So how does it know which one to talk to? One option would be to add a location service, perhaps backed by a traditional database to provide an authoritative location for objects. There are some downsides though. When a node is added or failed, uh, what handles rebalancing the data? How do we prevent the location server itself from becoming a bottleneck? It would be better if the Rados client could simply calculate the object location, perhaps using a static partition of the storage nodes by object name, prefix, or hash. 
that wouldn't really help with rebalancing, though. Instead, Ceph uses an algorithm called crush. Crush takes a thing to be placed and a cluster map and outputs an ordered set of OSDs. Instead of actually running the object's name itself through crush, however, we first map the very large number of objects into a pretty small number of placement groups, or PGs. Why? Consider what must happen when the cluster map changes. We must go through the things placed by crush and move some of them to a new home. But there might be many, many objects, even on a single uh, disk, and we don't want to rerun crush on each and every one of them. So instead, we first hash the objects into a large, into a set of placement groups, typically about 100 per OSD. Each placement group is then run through crush along with the current cluster map in order to output an ordered set of OSDs. Architecturally, placement groups also serve a number of other nice uh, functions. They act as the order, the uh, sorry, the unit of ordering and the unit of locking within each OSD. So the OSD acts more like a collection of uh, placement groups than a collection of objects. That ordered set of OSDs determines the primary and replicas for that placement group and the objects contained therein. So what happens when an OSD dies? The mapping changes as well. The monitors distribute a new cluster map with the defunct OSD marked as dead. As clients and other OSDs receive the new cluster map, they update their idea of where the PG should be placed based on the changed crush uh, placement. The new holders of the PG, when they find out about the new cluster map, uh, begin recovering the objects in the move PGs on their own without further coordination. A nice property of crush is that the placement groups are declustered. That means that if two placement groups share an OSD, typically their replica uh, those PGs replica, uh, the replicas won't. That means that if an OSD dot with 100 placement groups dies, rather than one new OSD having to, uh, receiving 100 new placement groups, our 100 different OSDs will each re-replicate about one copy. This greatly speeds up uh, recovery and reduces and prevents any single OSD from being a bottleneck for the most part. So what actually is it? Crush is a pseudo-random deterministic placement algorithm. We fundamentally take two inputs, a cluster map and a placement group, and return the OSDs on which the object should be placed, uh, the placement group should be placed. The cluster map can include rules and can model your data center's physical layout, allowing you to specify placement policy. Thus, while Crush is pseudo-random, you still retain a great deal of influence over placement. For example, you can write a rule that ensures that no two replicas are placed in the same host or in the same rack. You can also configure Crush to place more data on some OSDs than others if, for example, you add newer OSDs which happen to be larger. Crush also tends to move close to the minimum amount of data when the cluster map changes, which, if you think about it, is a good property for a placement algorithm. Okay. You can also divide up your objects by pool. Each pool can have its own Crush map and therefore has its own placement groups at its own replication level. You can also have some erasure-coded pools and some replicated pools in the same cluster. You can use this feature to place different applications on different kinds of storage. For example, you might want to back a Redis GW S3 workload with uh, disks while with spinning disks while using a separate pool backed by SSDs for more latency-sensitive virtual machines. So if the placement is that dynamic, how is an OSD to ever be sure it has actually seen all of the writes it needs to see before serving reads? The answer is peering. Each OSD map generated by the monitors is assigned an increasing epoch number. The monitors and OSDs remember all OSD maps back to some epoch E such that every placement group has been clean since epoch E. This history allows the primary after a mapping change for a particular placement group to determine which OSDs it must contact in order to be sure that it has learned about all completed writes. We represent the state of a PG on a particular OSD by keeping a list of the most recent operations on the placement group witnessed by that OSD. Peering results in an authoritative PG log being decided on. For each replica, the primary then checks whether the replica's log overlaps with the authoritative log. If it does, we can, use, uh, we can compare the two logs to construct a list of objects which need to be recovered on that peer. Otherwise, we can't and we will need to do something called backfill, where we scan the store of 
an up-to-date peer and the peer to be backfilled and use that to determine which objects need to be uh, recovered. The trick, however, is that if we don't know which objects are invalid because the logs don't overlap, we certainly can't serve reads or writes from, from such a peer. Thus, if after peering, if after peering the primary determines that it or any other peer requires backfill, it will request that the monitor cluster publish a new map with an exception to the crush mapping for this PG, mapping it to the best set of up-to-date peers that I can find. We call that a PG temp mapping. And the, o and the OSD map essentially just contains a list of these exceptions in addition to the crush rules. Once that map is published, peering will happen again because the map changed. And the up-to-date peers will independently conclude that they should serve that they should serve reads and writes while concurrently backfilling the correct peers. As an example, suppose Crush initially maps some placement group to OSD 0, 1, and 2. Then, for some reason, perhaps a user changed around the, the Crush hierarchy. Uh, in the next map, Crush maps it maps this placement group to 3, 4, and 5. For the record, generally you won't see a map a map change like that due to something like an OSD failure, but for you know instructive purposes. So uh, OSD 3 will then peer by requesting PG logs from 0, 1, 2, 4, and 5, because those are all of the ones that could have had a map in the, in the past. Also, as an aside, it needs to, re to receive a, a log from 0, 1, or 2, but not, uh, not, not all, all three. Essentially, in order for peering to proceed, you must receive a map from at least one OSD from each acting set where the uh, placement group might have served rights. So if one or so if one and two are down, it would suffice to talk to, to zero. But if zero were down, peering would stall until either zero, one, or two is brought back, which isn't surprising because then you wouldn't have any live copies of the placement group anyway. So at this point, three concludes that it four and five require backfill because the authoritative log has stuff in it and does not overlap its completely empty log, uh, and will request a new mapping zero, one, two from the monitors. The monitors will then insert this, ma this mapping into a new OSD map as an exception, and then uh, publish that map. During the next peering interval, zero will learn that it is primary. It will request PG logs from one, two, three, four, and five, and it will determine that three, four, and five require backfill, or that three, four, and five should be the uh, set of OSDs for displacement group, but they require backfill. So it will leave the exception in, in place and serve reads and writes while backfilling 3, 4, and 5. Once backfill completes, 0 will request that the temp mapping be cleared. Uh, the OSD, the monitors will dutifully publish a new map without that, that, that exception. And another peering interval will happen. 3 will peer by requesting PG logs from 0, 1, 2, 4, and 5, conclude that what 0, 1, 2 is a good mapping, and then we'll begin serving reads and writes. Then 3 will uh, notify 0, 1, and 2 that they are allowed to delete their local copies to, in order to free up space. So now that we've got some background on Rados and peering and recovery, let's talk a little bit about cache tiering. Conceptually, there are two ways you could think of doing tiering within Ceph. First, you can embed a combination of fast and slow storage under each OSD and let the backing OSD storage handle the placement of hot data in the fast storage and cold data in the slow storage. Uh, DM cache, B cache, flash cache, or any of a, a larger variety of caching controllers could be used in this way under the OSD without any change to the OSD code. But there are some drawbacks to that. Like for example, you must choose the ratio of hot to uh, cold data as you provision each node and it's difficult to change afterwards without going back to each node and changing the ratio. Or we could perform the tiering above the OSD. This would allow us to use different hardware for different tiers and would also allow us to dynamically change the hot cold balance by increasing the appropriate set of uh, machines. So the way this works is that uh, the storage, uh, you pools are able to act as uh, caches for other pools. So the application, the 
that is the Libretto Slayer, will see in the OSD map that this cache pool is set as a cache for the backing pool and will direct reads and writes optionally to the cache pool rather than to the backing pool. The primaries in the cache pool will then be responsible for um, either telling the client to redirect in the case that the object is missing or for uh, promoting flushing and evicting objects from itself as it fills up or needs to promote cold objects. So I mentioned before the pools can have different placement rules. This goes a step further by allowing, uh, oh, yes, I already covered this. So one of the main advantages to this is that this is largely transparent to the Libretos user. Um, from the Libretos user's point of view, they still connect to a particular pool, in this case, the backing pool. And behind the scenes, Libretos takes care of redirecting reads and writes to the appropriate caching pool. Thus, for RBD, Rados, GW, and CephFS, this should, uh, they work without uh, modification. So in write-back mode, the Libretos client operating on the backing pool will transparently direct all writes to the cache pool instead. On a cache hit, the write completes when the cache pool write completes. On a miss, the cache pool instance of the object will delay the write while it promotes the object from the backing pool. Similarly, reads are directed to the cache pool. A cache hit can, ser can be served directly out of cache since the cache pool sees all writes. In the event of a cache miss, the read can be redirected or proxied to the backing pool. Or if the policy uh, dictates that it should happen, the read can be delayed while the object is transparently promoted, as with writes. So we are able to make the cache tiering features fit nicely within the existing Ceph architecture. Other than the tiering relationship, base and cache pools are fully fledged Rados pools, complete with independent placement rules. Each OSD in the cache pool is able to handle caching decisions for its objects independently, ensuring scalability and avoiding the need for an external tiering agent. The promotion and eviction operations are themselves Rados operations. The cache tier OSDs actually act as Rados clients to the base pool OSDs. This means that the cache tier uh, objects that match map to a particular placement group in the cache tier, there is no relationship between that mapping and the mapping in the base uh, tier. So there might be many more placement groups in the base tier or many more placement groups in the caching tier. It doesn't matter because the primary in the cache pool or the cache tier doesn't actually know or care about the uh, object mapping for the base tier. It uses Libretos for that. The promotion of uh, Redis clients can see the cache configuration of the cluster map and use that to intelligently route requests between the cache and base pools as needed. To make intelligent decisions about which objects to evict as the cache fills up, we need a way to estimate the hotness of an object. Each placement group maintains an in-memory bloom filter of recent operations. Each filter is then filled for a specified period or up to a tuned false positive probability and then written to disk. You can then walk backwards through the filters on disk to um, estimate a uh, most recent access time for a particular object by simply checking each filter for a positive uh, result. Uh, in order to actually flush out cold data, we need to do, we need an, an agent though. So the thing, the problem with uh, flushing cold data is that you aren't accessing it. So you need an asynchronous process to scan the cold data and make uh, flushing, flush into Vic uh, dis decisions. So using the hot and cold information, the each cache pool PG primary can asynchronously scan its store and estimate the hotness for this object. We call that process the tiering agent. It's a per PG um, uh, agent, which the OSD will sort of schedule as 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 needed. That process is uh, once the pool reaches the target dirty ratio, the primary will begin attempting to flush sufficiently chilled objects. As the placement group approaches the target size, the primary will also begin evicting clean objects. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about erasure coding, which I think is one of the more exciting things that has happened in the last year. So up till now, Ceph has supported only conventional replication. If you wanted two copies of uh, redundancy, you need 3x replication. 
pay 200% overhead and storage costs. Disk may be cheap, but not quite that cheap. Enter erasure coding. Erasure codes allow you to take an object, break it into four chunks, create two additional parity chunks, and distribute those six chunks among six different OSDs, possibly split among three or six different racks. As long as you can recover any four of those chunks, you can recover the object, giving you two OSDs of failure tolerance for only a 50% overhead. Steph's approach to erasure coding requires the user to create an erasure coded pool with a specified erasure code. In this case, one with four data chunks and two parity chunks. That pool contains the erasure coded placement groups. Each placement group, as with replication, is assigned to an ordered set of OSDs. With four data chunks and two parity chunks, Crush would split would spit out an ordered set of six OSDs. The first four are the four data chunks, and while the last two are parity chunks. As with replication, one of the OSDs, usually the first one, will serve as the primary. Client requests, both reads and writes, will go to the primary. The primary is then responsible for fetching the data required to serve the request from the other OSDs, decoding it, and, re and responding to the client. Using the primary OSD to do the decoding greatly simplifies consistency, since it sees writes as well. Objects are striped across uh, data chunks 1 through 4 with the corresponding coding chunks stored in X and Y. Partial tail stripes include zero filled data chunks as needed. The stripe width or the stripe size is configurable on a per, on a per pool basis when the pool is created. So as I mentioned, as with replication, one of the OSDs, usually the first one, will serve as the primary. In order to read an object from an erasure coded pool, the client computes the location of the object using crush, as with the replicated placement group, and sends a read request to the primary. The primary then determines which chunks need to be read in order to fulfill the request and requests those chunks from the other placement group OSDs. Here, because we have all of the data chunks, there is no need to read the parity chunks. The primary then uses the pieces to reconstruct the requested data and respond to the client. Using the primary rather than the client to fetch the individual chunks has some advantages. First, it greatly simplifies the problem of ensuring that we are reading the same version of the object on all of the replicas, since the primary is able to order writes and reads on the, on the placement group. Second, the erasure coding CPU and memory overhead happen on the OSD rather than on the client, which might be beneficial if, for example, the OSDs are more numerous or more powerful than the clients. Lastly, the OSD to OSD network might be significantly faster than the client to OSD network, which would decrease uh, the cost. The downside, of course, is the additional hop and the additional bandwidth used. For a write, as with a replicated pool, we send the write request to the primary. The primary breaks the write down into the per chunk operations and sends them off to the other OSDs in the placement group and waits for a reply. Once all replicas have replied, the primary responds to the client with success. In the event that we have a degraded set of OSDs in the placement group, we simply write to the OSDs we do have. Ah, but suppose there is a previous, there is a brief power failure while the replicas are performing the writes, such that replicas one, two, and four have completed the write, but three X and Y have not. After the power comes back, our primary will peer and find three chunks with logs reflecting the new version B, and three chunks with logs missing the update for version B. In fact, either A or B would be a valid value for the object since the client has not yet received a, a response. With a replicated pool, the primary would simply choose one or the other and recover whichever copies ended up incorrect, trusting that the client via the cluster map will see that the OSDs restarted and resend the write. With an erasure coded pool, however, we have a problem in that we cannot recover either version A or B, since neither has the required four chunks left. Here we have some choices. Simply writing the data in place as with a replicated pool won't work for the reason I've mentioned, but we could try complicatedly writing the data in place by first writing to a pending operation log on each replica and then performing a second commit operation. But that would require a second round trip of, uh, a second round trip of network operations and disk commits, increasing latency even further. We chose instead to restrict the interface available to erasure-coded pools to only those operations that we can make pool backable using only local operations and the placement group log. Create, append, delete, and X adder updates. Fortunately, each placement group already maintains a PG log. Uh, the primary sends 
the new PG log entries representing each update to be committed on the replicas atomically with the update, and they're written out to disk atomically as well. This is how we normally determine which objects need to be recovered after an OSD has been down for a short period of time. But EC pools, erasure coded pools, also stash enough information to locally undo the operation of the PG log entries. For X adder updates, we stash the old values of the changed X adders in the PG log entry. For appends, we stash the old size of the object, allowing the replica to roll back by truncating to the old size. For delete, we instead rename the object out of the way and record in the PG log entry where to find the old version. We then clean up these old objects a bit later once all replicas have committed a particular update. We disallow object map operations altogether. First, it wasn't clear what there was to gain by applying erasure coding to a key value mapping subject to non sequential updates anyway. Second, it would be hard. So we punted on that one. Because the operation updating A to B can be locally rolled back, the primary will observe that version A is the best version, since the, prime, the client cannot have actually received a response for version B and will resend. And we can roll back A on all of the replicas. We can roll back to A on all of the replicas. The primary will then notify all replicas that the authoritative last commit is version A, and they will locally undo the change, and then the uh, placement group can begin accepting reads and writes. leaving us with only version A. This restricts the erasure coded pools to a subset of RADIS operations, notably no overwrites. Of course, the disallowed operations are also the ones which are inefficient to do on erasure coded objects anyway. If you tried to overwrite in the middle of an erasure coded object, either you have to maintain some kind of complicated log structure or you have to do a read modify write on each partial overwrite. Some applications can use erasure coded pools directly if they stick to the restricted interface. Uh, Redis GW mostly creates immutable objects anyway, and can use erasure coded pools for all of the bulk data storage pools it, it has. Other users can use a replicated cache pool in front of an erasure coded backing pool, and the tiering agent will simply refuse to flush anything with key value data. This is one of the reasons why we introduced cache tiering and erasure coding at the same time. So which erasure code are we actually using? Well, there are a lot of well-explored algorithms for generating parity blocks. And you probably have noticed that I haven't specified which one we're using. That's because we made the erasure code algorithm and implementation pluggable. You can specify the plugin and, er and erasure code when creating the pool. So different pools can use different erasure code plugins and algorithms. Currently, there are several plugins, including JErasure, iSale from Intel, and an LRC plugin, which layers over other algorithms. Each erasure code provided by a plugin must provide a few simple things like a way to encode, decode data, a way to determine which chunks are required to perform a read, and a way to determine which chunks are required to recover a set of missing chunks. The OSD takes those interfaces and handles everything else. Erasure coding also introduces another wrinkle. Let's say we have a one terabyte OSD which contains only replicated placement groups, which dies. With replication, we will need to read one terabyte worth of objects which were stored in that dead OSD from replicas and write them out to their new homes. Of course, because of declustered placement, many OSDs will be reading or writing a part of the degraded objects. So maybe each OSD is only writing out a few hundred, uh, a few hundred, uh, a few gigabytes. But still, one terabyte needs to be read and one terabyte needs to be written. Suppose, however, that the OSD in question is storing erasure-coded placement groups. In order to recover one terabyte of chunks lost with our dead OSD, we must actually read four terabytes of data. As with replication, the recovery would be declustered and many OSDs would split up the work, but the total amount read and written wouldn't change. The improvement in storage overhead thus comes at a cost in disk and network to recover from failed nodes. There is also a CPU cost associated with reconstructing the lost chunks from the recovered chunks. This can be particularly troublesome if the erasure-coded chunks are distributed across racks. So local recovery codes provide some help here. Suppose each dotted box is a rack. LRC allows you to layer an additional set of, in this case, per rack parity bo blocks to allow you to recover from a single failure within a rack using only chunks within that rack. You can layer uh, LRC over any of the over any other plugin or erasure code choice. So that's the end of most of what I've got 
covered. Um, I think of a future work slide, maybe. Yeah, so future work for erasure coding will probably involve uh, allowing optimistic client reads directly from shards. This shouldn't be super impossible because, uh, as I mentioned, we're you we you can only do appends or deletes really or X header updates on those objects. So it should be fairly straightforward when doing a data read to simply make sure that uh, you handle the case that you failed to find a, a node there and retry. So it should be possible to embed um, version numbers in the responses and allow the client to retry in the case that they get a torn read. We're also interested in uh, some kind of, or in a erasure code plugin to allow optimizations for ARM for JErasure. Uh, for the cache pools, a lot of the future work will be involved, will, will be, will surround improving the way the agent makes uh, decisions so that we're smarter about which objects to flush and evict. <clears throat> and more complicated topologies like multiple read-only cache tiers and multiple sites. So do we have questions? You guys can still hear me, right? Yeah. OK, good. Sounds good, Sam. If you have questions, feel free to unmute and ask Sam. Otherwise, you can also type them in the chat. Yep. I left some time for questions in case you guys had specific areas you wanted me to go into detail in. So feel free to fire away if there are any topics you uh, would like covered. All right, I'm not hearing any questions. Uh, we can always do follow-ups later. Uh, this will be posted on YouTube and I'll get the slides and post them up on our slide share as well so that they're linked. Uh, and as always, we will answer questions on the mailing lists and IRC. So thanks for coming everybody and thanks Sam for running through this.